45 years, zero name changes, new offices, more staff, improved technology to better serve you. Education, services, investments, think real estate, think Marshall Reddit, brokerage, property management, private lending, creating financial independence through real estate since 1979. Good evening, Marshall Reddick investors. Welcome to tonight's presentation on estate planning. This is a topic that many of you have asked for, and I know you're going to get a lot of value out of tonight's presentation. But before we get started, I'd like to take a moment and talk a little bit about Marshall Reddick Real Estate and the ways we are different from a traditional brokerage, and also the ways we like to help our investors with all things real estate related. Marshall Reddick uh, was founded in 1979, and unlike a traditional brokerage where uh, we help our clients buy and sell real estate, we also help our clients uh, with investment properties across the country in our vetted markets. Most of our clients own rental properties under their portfolio. Our next division is property management. Now, there's no point in owning a great investment property if you don't have great property management to oversee your investment. Marshall Reddick has boots on the ground with management 24 seven service in our vetted markets. We also have a private lending division. And what does that mean? So let's say you wanna invest in real estate, but you don't wanna own the physical property. Well, you can be the bank. In other words, you can find one of our fully underwritten loans from anywhere from three months to 30 years, depending on the note, you can collect the mortgage payment and be the banker. This is a great way to invest in real estate without actually owning the asset. And under our private financing umbrella, you can also be a borrower. We qualify borrowers based on property. And this is great if you only want to do a fix and flip or investment transaction and don't want to go through the hassle of conventional lending processes. And last but not least, we have the Marshall Reddick Mortgage Fund. It's an investment fund that is designed for investors to pull their resources together or a portion of the notes on many different properties. This is a great vehicle for investors who don't want to take the time to pick and choose their own private mortgage mortgages to fund. I also wanted to just take a quick moment and tell you a little bit about myself for those who don't don't already know me, my name is Sherry. I've been a licensed real estate broker for over 20 years. I also spent seven years in real estate finance. I've lived in California my whole life and bought and sold numerous rental properties over the years and investment properties. I'm also an avid investor in the private lending and Marshall Reddick Mortgage Fund. So real estate's really always been my passion. I purchased my first uh, home at the age of 20 and now I really truly enjoy helping my clients navigate it through their investment journey, both primary and investment property. This is a footprint of our boots on the ground vetted markets. Gives you a little bit of an idea how far of a reach we have with our investors. This is a little sampling of our team in multiple states. And I would also like to now take uh, the chance to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, Tiffany Chu. She's been practicing law for 16 years. She is a Marshall Reddick preferred partner. We do a lot with Tiffany and I know she's gonna give you lots of valuable in information tonight. And I am very happy to turn the screen over to Tiffany. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, again, my name is Tiffany. I'm so pleased to be here with um, all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. And today I'm talking about what I basically do day in and day out. I do a lot of the state planning and I've been doing that for uh, for about 16 years. Um, just a little bit about myself. I myself have a family of five. I have three kids. I've been married for 22 years. I have three kids. My oldest is now 15. I have an 11 year old and my youngest is almost eight. And um, I love doing this with other families and I just wanted to present my family myself because I have context um, to what we're doing um, when we do an estate plan. And a lot of the thoughts that my clients come in with are things that I've thought about with my own family and um, experiences that I've had myself and um, in concerns that I want to make sure that I address with my clients, I think about with my own family as well. 
Um, like Sherry said, I have, have been practicing law for about 16 years now, and before I did estate planning, I was a tax and joint ventures associate in a national law firm. I worked as a firm here, and I still keep in touch with a lot of my colleagues um, and did actually have done a lot of their estate plans as well. Um, it's been really helpful to have this tax background. When I had transitioned to estate planning, there are lots of tax issues that we address when uh, we talk about your estate plan, income taxes, property taxes, estate taxes, and having that tax ground is really helpful. Um, and in 2010, I started my own firm. And after working in my own firm or doing pract or practicing on my own for 13 years, I joined my team at Modern Wealth Law. Right now we have six people. Unfortunately, we don't have an updated team picture of all six of us, but we do have two attorneys, myself and my partner, John. And we have two of our paralegals, they're pictured at April and Jenna, and we also have two more admins that help us out. Um, and we just we love our team and they are just excellent in terms of what their, um, their means of serving our clients. Um, we all just have uh, a passion for what we do. Let's see, In our firm at Modern Wealth Law, we practice estate planning, we do asset protection, we have a lot of clients who have properties. Um, like yourself, we create LLCs. We talk about Wyoming LLCs versus California LLCs. We talk about land trust with our clients to maintain privacy for your property so that people can do a search for your name and find the property that you own. Uh, we also do trust and probate administration, which I think is incredibly helpful on the estate planning side of things. We know how what happens to our trust after someone passes away. We carry out the terms of those trusts. And if people don't have a trust, we also do the probate administration, which is also helpful to give some context as to what we're trying to avoid when we create your estate plan for you. Uh, we think, I think uh, our firm is particularly, it stands out. Uh, we have a certified specialist in estate planning. And what that means is that we take a test, um, a day long test to have this certification um, granted by the state bar. Uh, just further um, affirms our expertise in this particular area of the law. Well, I'm going to start my presentation uh, and with uh, this quote by Judge Van Dyke. Um, it really captures what we're trying to do when we do your estate plan and what rights that we are trying to further um, when we help you create your plan to dispose of your assets in accordance to your wishes. The right to dispose of property and contemplation of death is as old as the right to acquire and possess property. And the laws of all civilized countries recognize and protect this right, including um, the laws of the United States. And so that's what we're trying to do is help you carry out your wishes um, and make sure that your assets are disposed of in, in accordance to those wishes. All these assets that you've accumulated and worked so hard for during your lifetime should go to the people that you want to go to without the complications of probate and the expenses of probate, uh, without all the litigation. If we clearly have this estate plan laid out, um, hopefully we are discouraging anyone from making, um, contesting the terms of it so that all of your assets go to those that you wish. Um, to benefit from them. I usually like to start what we call our design meetings um, with a framework of what your estate plan does for you. So in our firm, we, how we start our process, people give us a call and we uh, talk to our potential clients. And if they wanted to move forward with us, we schedule this design meeting. And before the design meeting, we ask our clients to fill out an intake form where um, I can look at it before our meeting and um, address any or write down any issues that I want to address with my clients. But before we get into their particular estate plan, what I like to do is give my clients a framework of how to think of their assets. And so what we start off with is this presentation. And so what we're doing when we come into our design meeting is creating your estate plan. And during your lifetime, we're pretty familiar with how you manage your assets. If you are the owner of a particular home or an account, then you are the only one who gets to manage it. So if the statement only says your name, Tiffany Chu, on the statement, or if the deed of my home only says Tiffany Chu, then I'm the only one who gets to manage it. If my husband of 22 years tries to call Bank of America and say, hey, that account that's only in my wife's name, I need to take some money out of it. Bank of America will say, I'm sorry, you're not authorized. Um, Tiffany is the only owner on the account. And even though you've been married for so long, um, this is not an account that you can manage. So we're familiar with um, us as the owners are the only ones who can manage a particular asset. 
And when people come into our office and to do, to do their design meeting, what they're thinking about is what happens to our assets upon our death? Oftentimes my clients have heard of probate and what probate is, is a process, it's a court supervised process where after someone passes away, if I were to pass away and I had assets like a bank account and a home in my name still, it doesn't automatically transfer to living people. And just because I passed away, it doesn't magically transfer to my husband or to my kids. In order to get those assets transferred to beneficiaries or heirs, it has to go through a probate process. And in that process, the court takes jurisdiction over all of my assets and um, they appoint somebody called a personal representative to represent my estate. And as a personal representative, this person gets to step into my shoes. So everything that I own now, the personal representative can manage it. And um, the in probate, we have a statutory period of time where creditors can make a claim against all of my estate. If I owe um, a, a money to a credit card company that needs to be paid in probate um, before my house can be distributed to my beneficiaries, my mortgage needs to be paid off. And if um, that all gets taken care of in probate, and after that period of time where creditors are make a claim and are paid, then the remainder of the assets can be distributed to living people. And so in probate, um, there it's something that people generally want to avoid because it's really expensive. It can be very time consuming. In Orange County, uh, uncontested probate takes about a year, more than a year now. In LA County, we finished one up in about uh, a year and a half. And those are uncontested, pretty straightforward probate proceedings. So it's just a lot longer than people want to wait uh, before they inherit their assets. And it just is a lot, very expensive. We can get an estate plan. We, we start our estate plans for less. It's a fraction of the cost compared to probate. If you have a $1 million estate, and in California, if you own property, you probably have a $1 million estate at least. That costs $23,000 in statutory attorney's fees, which means that it's not, if you go down the street to another office, um, attorney's office to help you, they would probably charge the same fees, so $23,000 for probating just a home. Um, and something you want to avoid, and with your estate plan, we address how to avoid probate and how to dispose of your assets upon your death. We also address how to dispose of your assets or have somebody manage your assets in the event of your incapacity. So if I'm still alive, but I somehow do not have the capacity to manage my own assets, I don't understand what's going on, then without an estate plan, without documents in place, my husband perhaps will have to ask a court to appoint him as my conservator so that he can again step into my shoes and manage my bank account or manage my house that I own in my own name. And if he needed to refinance the house so that he can pay for my medical bills, as my conservator, he'd be able to do that. But that has to, that requires a court process. And again, we want to avoid court because it's very expensive and very time consuming. So in your estate plan, we want to make sure that your assets are managed in the event of your incapacity and when you pass away. And when we do your estate plan, it's really important for us to consider everything that you own. And everything you own is going to fit into one of these four buckets I have. The first bucket is a trust bucket. We have a payable on death bucket, a joint tenancy bucket. And our last bucket is this probate bucket. This probate bucket typically has assets like bank accounts and um, anything that is in just one person's name. So those account, that account that I have, that house that I own in just my name is in this probate bucket. And when I pass away, anything that's in this probate bucket is going to be subject to that court proceeding where a judge steps in and supervises the distribution of all these assets to my beneficiaries. Our goal in our estate plan is to keep assets out of this bucket. So by the end of our estate planning pro process, I don't want any of my clients having assets that are just in their individual name with no beneficiary. Otherwise, it's in this probate bucket. This joint tenancy bucket usually has assets like my client's homes or their bank accounts if they're married. And when it's in this bucket, what that means is that at least two owners, we have at least two owners for this particular asset, husband and wife is joint tenants. And when you hold an asset as joint tenant, what you're expressing is your intention that if one of you passes away, one joint tenant passes away, you want your surviving joint tenant to automatically assume ownership of the entire asset. 
same thing with your bank accounts. Um, if you own your bank accounts, husband and wife as joint tenants, one person passes away, doesn't go through probate. It does automatically go to the surviving joint tenant. And But when the surviving joint tenant is the only owner of this asset, everything in this bucket is now in this probate bucket because we need two owners to be in this joint tenancy bucket. So now these, this house and this bank account is in the probate bucket and when the surviving joint tenant passes away, it's going to go through probate before going to your children. So our goal in our estate plan generally is to leave assets out of this bucket as well. And instead what we wanna do is transfer all the assets that we put into either the joint tenancy bucket or the probate bucket. We want all of those assets to go into this trust bucket. And when assets are titled in the trust, instead of this home being owned by Tiffany Chu, it's owned as Tiffany Chu, trustee of the Tiffany Chu Trust. And we, our firm, provides or uh, drafts a deed to transfer your home into the trust so that we can make sure that these, this is your biggest asset is going to be in this trust. And when it is titled in that way, then it's subject to the terms of the first document we draft for you, this living trust. So this trust starts off by saying that while I'm alive, I get to do whatever I want with the assets that I put into this trust. If I want to take money out of my bank account and go on a vacation, I can do that. If I want to sell my home, I can do that. I can also make additions to this trust. If I buy another piece of property, I can title it as Tiffany Chu, trustee of the Tiffany Chu Trust. And now it's in this bucket as well. This trust though, what it does say also is, if I'm ever incapacitated, I trust my spouse, Randy Chu, to be able to step into my shoes and manage everything that I put into this trust. And so instead of having to go to court, be appointed the conservator, he is going to be my successor trustee. And if I, the trustee um, at the initial drafting of this document, if I cannot manage my trust anymore, then my husband will be able to manage it on my behalf. And sometimes clients want to put more than just one person and we have a succession of people. If it's not my, my husband, then it's my adult child. If it's not my adult child, maybe it's a sibling of mine. And that's helpful too, to make sure that we plan for these contingencies in case um, other people that I've listed are unavailable to serve as a trustee. But in any case, everything in this bucket will be managed by the trustee I appoint in the event of my capacity. And everything in this bucket, this trust will say, Upon my death, what's going to happen to all the assets in my trust? And who is going to distribute my assets for me? And that person is also called a successor trustee. And because we have this person named in my trust document, what I'm saying is I don't need a court to get involved and distribute my assets. I want this person, I trust this person, to distribute all the assets I put into my trust in accordance to my wishes as laid out in this Tiffany Chu Trust. And this person is now responsible for transferring everything into the beneficiaries that I've listed. So our goal in our estate plan is to put most of our assets in this trust. However, we are going to leave some assets in this payable on death bucket. And what in here typically includes life insurance policies, 401ks, 457s, any retirement accounts, IRAs. They're all usually in this payable on death bucket. And so instead of assets uh, in this bucket being titled in the name of the trust, they're still titled in my individual name, Tiffany Chu. But they're not in this probate bucket because assets that are in this payable on death bucket, they have a beneficiary. If you have life insurance or if you have a retirement account, when you open your account or when you purchase your life insurance, you were asked to fill out a beneficiary designation form. And that form says, if I pass away or if the insured, when the insured passes away or when the retirement account owner passes away, I want the balance of this account or the proceeds of the life insurance to go to this person that I list as my beneficiary. And that beneficiary designation form is on file with the life insurance company or with your retirement account holder. And they are responsible for transferring these assets to the beneficiaries that you listed. Um, on that beneficiary designation form. So when I'm this framework that I give to my clients, what I want them to see is that all of their assets are going to fit into one of these four buckets. And the bucket that it fits under is going to be dependent on who owns the asset. 
if it's owned by the trust, it's going to be in this bucket and managed according to the terms of this trust. If it's owned if, um, by the individual with a beneficiary, then it's in this bucket and it avoids probate because that institution that holds your asset is going to be responsible for transferring it to the beneficiaries you've listed. If you have a joint account owner or a joint tenant for a piece of property, it's in this bucket. And when one person passes away, it goes to the other, the surviving joint tenants. But even though it avoids probate upon one joint tenant's death, we call, just remember that we need more than one person in this bucket. And eventually, if we don't ever transfer it into the trust, it does go to this probate bucket that we want to avoid because we don't want to go through a court process to have our assets transferred to our heirs. So in your state plan, we have all these assets. The trust, um, the trust document is going to govern assets in this bucket. We also draft a power of attorney for financial matters for our clients that is, manages um, their assets in the event of incapacity for assets in the payable on death bucket, the joint tenancy bucket, and the probate bucket. And we also uh, draft healthcare documents, the healthcare power of attorney, otherwise known as the advanced healthcare directive. And we also draft HIPAA authorizations for our clients. And we do a will, um, and if you a will is also necessary when we do an estate plan. The will takes care of assets that are in this probate bucket. And if you did leave anything in probate when you passed away, the will disposes of that, and the will basically says we want everything to be transferred over into our trust. So that's your estate plan. That's kind of the foundational estate plan that I think every person, every adult needs. All right, let's see. And so that's kind of the foundational estate plan, like I said. But when our clients come into our, our office to do the design meeting, they do often have an idea of how they want their assets distributed. And um, what sets us apart, our firm apart from other firms, we think, is what we, uh, the options that we give to our clients. And we often say, you just don't know what you don't know. If you come in and tell us how you want your assets, we can certainly draft a, uh, documents to dispose of your assets according to what you come in thinking you want it to be disposed of. Um, but we also want to give you options to make sure that you're addressing concerns that maybe you didn't think of. So some common concerns. Um, oftentimes people come into our, other, our office and says, they say after we, uh, usually if it's a couple, they think, okay, well, after we both pass away, we want all of the assets remaining in our trust or all of the assets that we own when we pass away. We want it to be divided equally among our children. And this is one of the first points we address. Do we think that equal is necessarily fair? So let me illustrate. We'll start with the Doe Family Trust. John Doe and Jane Doe come into our office and they create the Doe Family Trust. And they say, after we pass away, we want everything in the Doe Family Trust to be distributed equally to Janie Doe and Johnny Doe. And once we pass away again, equally to Johnny and Janie Doe. So if something happens to Johnny, uh, John and Jane, the parents, then what that means is everything left in the Doe Family Trust is going to be immediately divided into two different shares, one share for jo Janie and one share for Johnny. But what if Johnny has a medical condition and his share is then depleted, paying for all his medical bills, all his medication? What if Janie got into an Ivy League, a private college, but she thinks, oh, I don't want to go to Harvard because it's going to deplete my entire inheritance from our parents? Do you want her decision to go to a really good school to be affected by the fact that it might deplete her entire inheritance. Is that what you wanted? And so what we suggest to our clients is perhaps instead of dividing it equally right when you pass away, if anything should happen when the kids are still young, maybe we should keep all the assets in the Doe family trust. And we'll keep it in one pot for the benefit of both Janie and Johnny, so that if Johnny needs to pay for his medication, we're going to take it from the family pot. If Janie decides to go to an expensive private institution, then we're gonna take it from the family pot. It usually mimics the way that our families want to spend their money on their kids um, if they were still alive. And at some point though, Johnny and Janie want to deal with their own money. So we say when the youngest child reaches a certain age, 
maybe 22 or 23, an age that we often think of as having graduated from undergrad. Then we're going to divide these assets into as many shares as we have children. So two shares here. And at that point, Janie gets her share and Johnny gets his share. And so what we mean by this is equally doesn't, in equal division, right when the parent passed away, isn't necessarily what our clients want. And what we explain to them is perhaps you want to keep everything in a pot for the benefit of our, our both of your children or all of your children until they reach a certain age, at which point then we'll divide the pot and distribute the remaining assets to the kids. So that's one thing that we try to talk to our clients about. And oftentimes they agree. We do want to treat our trust and we want to treat our family, even if we're not here, we want to treat it as though we were here and we are paying for everything from this one family pot. Another thing that we often address is protecting your assets for your kids. So let's start again with the Doe Family Trust. At the John and Jane Doe create the Doe Family Trust, which is regal. And what that means is that while John and Jane are alive, they can always change the terms of the Doe Family Trust. And we'll talk about later why they might want to do that during their life. But for now, in our design meeting, we're creating the Doe Family Trust and we're planning for the circumstances that we currently know of. And um, my clients tell me, well, after the Doe Family Trust, after one of us passes away, we want everything remaining in the Doe Family Trust to go to the survivor's trust, to the surviving spouse. And we want the survivor just to be able to do whatever he or she wants with the assets in here. So this survivor's trust is also revocable. And while the survivor's alive, they can take money out, they can put money in, they can take, um, sell houses, sell a house, buy a new house and throw it in the survivor's trust as well. They have unlimited assets, no restrictions as to how they use the assets in the survivor's trust. And when we do this design meeting, we also say when the survivor passes away, according to my client's wishes, they want everything to go to their children. But what I try to bring up to my clients, and this is a concern that um, a lot of my clients have, a lot of times they come in thinking, okay, well, we want a really traditional estate plan, pretty simple. We want everything to go to my surviving spouse, and after my surviving spouse passes to the kids. Well, this is their estate plan. I bring up, though, what if your surviving spouse, because this trust is revocable, what if the surviving spouse meets somebody else? And because the surviving the survivor's trust is revocable, what if that somebody else tells them, hey, let's not give it to the kids when you pass away. I'm going to need some of that money. So why don't you change? Why don't you amend your survivor's trust so that whatever's left over when you pass away, it goes to me. And that person could would essentially be disinheriting your children. Um, some clients, you know, maybe they're not, you know, people say, well, I trust my my spouse. They're, of course, going to take care of their kids, our kids. And I often say that's definitely true. You know, I, I agree. I trust my spouse, too. He wants to take care of our kids as well. Um, but you don't know what who your spouse might meet after. And it may not even be a new spouse. It may not even be a new significant other. Maybe it's just someone who's looking out to abuse elders. And this, unfortunately, we've seen a lot in our practice, where we've seen older people being taken advantage of and having um, people in their life come into their life and having them change their trust. Um, and so if you want to protect your portion of the assets from these kind of elder abusers or anyone that your surviving spouse might meet after you pass, you want to protect your portion of the assets um, for your kids then what we suggest is instead of everything going after, instead of drafting the Doe Family Trust to say that all the assets go to the survivor's trust when one spouse passes, maybe we'll split the assets of the Doe Family Trust into two trusts, the survivor's trust and the decedent's trust. So this Doe Family Trust consists of assets that belong both to, um, to both spouses, let's say a traditional husband and a wife. And if you're in California, if you've acquired these assets in the Doe Family Trust while you're married, then all the assets are considered community property assets, which means 50% of the assets in the Doe Family Trust belong to the husband, and 50% of the assets in the Doe Family Trust belong to the wife. And when we say one person passes away, what happens to these assets? The survivor's portion, let's say the survivor's the wife, 
that 50% goes to the survivor's trust. But if the husband passes away and wants his portion to be going into a decedent's trust, then that 50% goes into this trust. And this decedent's trust is irrevocable, which means the survivor cannot change the terms of this decedent's trust while he or she is alive. But the survivor, we can write the decedent's trust to say that the survivor can benefit survivor's trust. He or she is the beneficiary of the survivor's trust. The survivor can even be the trustee of the decedent's trust. But what the survivor cannot do is change the terms of the decedent's trust. And when you write this trust, it says after the survivor passes away, everything left over is going to go to the kid. And the survivor can't change that. So if you're interested in making sure that your portion of the assets in the Doe Family Trust goes to your intended beneficiaries, then this is something that you might want to consider instead of having everything go to your surviving spouse. So this is an option. Um, another common thing that we encounter is our clients wanting to protect their children's inheritance. So in this situation, when I see old trusts, it often says, to Janie Doe or to my child, after my husband, after both spouses pass away, we want all of our assets left over to go to our children outright and free of trust. Which means after John Doe and Jane Doe pass away, all million dollars left in the Doe family trust is going to be written out. There's going to be a check that's going to be written out to Janie Doe, which means Janie takes this check and she deposits it into an account. And if, she, if she's married, she probably, she might deposit it into an account with her charming husband. And she'll, and what we call, we call this combing. This check that she received as her inheritance is actually her separate property. But she's been married for a while, so she says, I'm going to deposit it into this joint account, just not to make anything messy. I don't want to manage a different account. But years later, Mr. Charming might decide, I don't want to be married to Janie Doe anymore, and he breaks her heart. And he says, well, that account that we have all of your, all of your money in, including the money that your parents gave you, all of that's community property. Because whatever your parents gave you, if you guys are familiar with separate property, it's generally separate property, which means that assets that you acquire during your marriage from your family as a gift or an inheritance, that's considered completely yours. But if you commingled it and put it into an account, Mr. Charming is going to say, we've already used your parents' inheritance. We, you know, we, made, we uh, made those improvements on our house years ago. So what's left over in that account is community property. 50% is mine and 50% is yours. And if you do leave your assets outright and free of trust to your children in your trust, then this is a potential scenario. Another scenario that people are concerned about is, well, what if Janie gets into a car accident and that person decides to sue Janie? And if she received her inheritance outright and free of trust, she deposits it in, into an account, then this person who got into a car accident suing Janie can reach all the assets that you left to, to Janie, to your children. And so if those are concerns of yours, then what we suggest is Maybe not to leave assets outright and free of trust to your, to your children. We say to Janie Doe in trust. And what that means is that instead of when John and Jane pass away, instead of just writing a check to Janie Doe for the million dollars that's left over, they have to write it to the Janie Doe Trust. And this Janie Doe Trust is irrevocable, which means Janie can't change the terms of it. But we need a trustee for a trust. We can say in the Doe Family Trust that Janie is the trustee of the Janie Doe Family Trust. And as the trustee, she gets to manage her own assets and she's the beneficiary of this Janie Doe Trust. So it kind of makes it easier. If you are concerned about your children's ability to manage assets, either because they haven't demonstrated financial responsibility or they're just not old enough to, manage, to be the trustee of their own trust, then we can certainly put someone else as a trustee of their trust and we can also say when they reach the age of 30 or after they've completed college or something because so at some point your child can be the, their own trustee of their trust in any case what you're doing is leaving their inheritance to their irrevocable trust and when Janie and mr charming decide to get a divorce 
Mr. Charney, because Janie received her assets in an irrevocable trust, what that means is that she had to deposit her inheritance into a separate account called the Janie Doe Trust. Janie Doe, trustee of the Janie Doe Trust. And when Mr. Charming and her get a divorce, or if they get a divorce, Mr. Charming cannot reach the assets in her irrevocable trust. It's better that her property was clearly from her family, her parents. Also, if Janie ever gets into that car accident, the car, um, the person suing her cannot reach the assets in this irrevocable trust. Because assets in an irrevocable trust are not considered that person is a beneficiary. It's not going to be considered Janie Doe because with an irrevocable trust, what that means is that you cannot change the terms of it anymore. And creditors can only reach assets that are considered yours, considered um, assets that you have full control over. And since you cannot change the terms of an irrevocable trust, they're not considered yours anymore, and um, anything in that irrevocable trust cannot be reached by creditors. So this often is a great opportunity for um, clients to protect their children's inheritances from divorcing spouses and creditors. Um, on the plus side, if something positive happens, what if Janie Joe does incredibly well in her life? She um, makes a lot of money and uh, she now has something called an estate tax issue, which means she passes away with more money than the estate tax exemption. And now she owes a tax of anything over the estate tax exemption, which currently under current law is $13.61 million. Uh, anything, if she passes away with anything over $13.61 million, tax at a 40% tax rate. But if you create this irrevocable trust for Janie, then everything that you left to Janie is not counted towards her estate and will not be subject to estate taxes. So that's another benefit of one of these irrevocable trusts. Oftentimes, um, again, you don't know what you don't know. So if you come into our office saying, hey, we just want our client, or we do want our, our kids to get it, um, get their uh, their inheritance equal, equally after we both pass away, we present the spot trust option, um, we present this this trust option, this irrevocable trust option, um, to just let you guys know that these are options that are available to our clients, and you can certainly add those to your trust because, again, back to that um, quote in the beginning, you are in control, you that right to dispose of your property however you wish is something that you can do in your own trust. Okay, when should I update my estate plan? And oftentimes, um, there are going to be lots of life circumstances to change. Good thing your Doe Family Trust, the family trust that you create, is a revocable trust. And we do have certain changes in your life and certain changes in the stages of your life that we advise our clients to take another look at their estate plan. Of course, if you, um, if there's a change in your marital status, if you've gotten married or if you've gotten divorced, then it's a good opportunity for you to revisit your estate plan to see how you need to update it given those changes. You certainly don't um, if our clients get a divorce, if we have a husband and wife created a joint trust together and they're um, getting a divorce, we have to update their estate plan, um, basically revoke the current joint trust and create separate estate plans for each husband and wife. Each spouse. Um, if your children are getting married, then perhaps that urgency of protecting your kids' inheritances from their divorcing spouse is something that has now become more urgent and you want to include those irrevocable trusts in your trust. Um, that's something that you might want to take into consideration um, if that is a circumstance of change in your life. If you're a young family and you've had additions to your family, you've added more children, or if you have more grandchildren, you might want to change your estate plan to revisit that to see whether or not you want to um, leave some assets to those children or grandchildren. Um, Perhaps if you have more children, the guardians that you previously chose in your estate plan are not going to be able to handle more children. So maybe you want to update your guardians um, to people that you think could manage more all of your children. In the event of incapacity or death, you might also want to um, take a look at your estate plan. Of course, not necessarily your death, but if someone you've listed as a trustee, for instance, of your estate plan, or even as a beneficiary in your estate plan, passed away or is incapacitated, you might want to revisit your estate plan. You certainly don't want to leave assets to an incapacitated person, um, someone who might be dependent on government benefits. Um, if you leave assets to someone like that outright, then you might disqualify them from their government benefits, which is definitely not something that's going to benefit or be helpful to them. So if any of your beneficiaries um, all of a sudden become um, disabled, 
and are de dependent on government benefits, you want to revisit your estate plan. If any of your trustees, the people you chose as successor trustees in your estate plan have passed, or you no longer have that same relationship with them, then you might you also want to take a look at your estate plan to update those trustees. Um, other changes in your life, if you acquired a business, if you started a business, then you definitely want to make sure that you take that business into consideration for your estate plan. During COVID, this, off, uh, this unfortunately happened a few times where uh, um, some of my clients came um, after their spouse passed away and their spouse owned a business and that business was never transferred into the trust. That became very complicated. We had to probate that business. Um, we needed to appoint somebody to be able to manage the account that was titled in that business. So if you acquire a business, um, then you want to revisit your estate plan to make sure that it's consistent with your estate plan and that it's not subject to probate. If you're selling an interest in a business as well, you want to update your documents to avoid confusion. I recently had a matter where um, a client has a property in a business, um, but he also has legitimate businesses in his business. And he wants to leave that property to his, his child, but the businesses to his um, spouse. And um, that would be very confusing. So we needed to update his documents to make sure that his wishes were clear. Uh, let's see. Changes in your net worth would also warrant a, uh, another look at your estate plan. Um, if you anticipate an inheritance, there's a lot of planning that you can do before you inherit money. Um, to make sure that it's consistent with your plans. For instance, if you already have an estate tax issue, and what that means is that your net worth is currently going to exceed the estate tax exemption so that when you pass away, your estate is subject to estate taxes. And again, the current estate tax exemption is $13.61 million, and that's per person, which means a couple has about $27.2 million that they can pass to their children estate tax free. If you exceed that exemption, then and you are anticipating an inheritance that's going to carry you above, uh, even further above that exemption, then there's some planning that we can do before you receive that inheritance. Of course, if you actually did receive that inheritance and then you come to my office, we can talk about some planning that we can do to minimize your estate taxes. Maybe we'll create some gift trusts for your children or your grandchildren to minimize your estate, to lower the estate tax exposure for the assets that are in your estate. Um, you might want to change um, your estate plan as your net worth increases because what you're leaving to your children is just too much for them to, um, to manage. Maybe you want to consider a professional fiduciary, maybe you want to consider other people, maybe co-trustees in your estate plan to help your children manage that amount of money. Maybe you want to set some parameters um, for how they can make these distributions from these trusts that you created from them for them in your estate plan. And again, you might want to take another look at your estate plan as your net worth um, bumps up against that estate tax exemption. Again, the estate tax exemption is currently at $13.61 million, and we'll kind of briefly touch upon it later. That estate tax exemption is scheduled to sunset to about $7 million in 2022. So um, if you have estate tax issues, um, then that's another reason to, to take another look at your estate plan. Um, another other reasons are acquiring new assets, like I said, business or uh, businesses or disposed of old assets to avoid confusion. So you want to update some of those dispositive provisions. Let's say um, husband and wife, um, they have grown children and they decided that they wanted to help one of their children buy a piece of property. And they titled that piece of property in their trust, but they intend for that piece of property to go to that child they bought it for. Then you're going to want to update your trust to make sure it says this piece of property that we just bought located in Irvine, California. This one upon our death goes to child A. Um, if you don't make those changes to your trust, then your assets are going to be distributed according to the terms of those current trusts, which usually says everything's divided equally after both husband and wife. Now, if you have an asset that you want to specifically give to somebody, then you're going to need to change your estate plan to address that. Cryptocurrency, those are just things that people are acquiring nowadays um, that uh, need to, oh, it's an asset that you own, it's going to fit into one of those four buckets, so we need to talk about how to put that in the trust bucket. 
If you become the investor of a fund, that's something else that we want to make sure that we consider. Also an asset that fits into one of those four buckets we talked about earlier, so we want to make sure it goes into the trust bucket. And there are, if you have firearms, there are laws in California that govern the distribution of those assets, so make sure that those um, provisions are addressed in your estate plan as well. Other changes that would warrant a look at your estate plan are changes to the federal and state laws. Um, like I mentioned, the uh, estate tax exemption is scheduled to decrease. Um, that was actually increased by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that went into effect January 1st, 2018. At that time, uh, the estate tax exemption was about five and a half million dollars. And so what the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act did was double the exemption to $11 million, but it did so for 10 years. Uh, well, it has a 10 year period of time and that from the effective date to the um, sunset time, it will be increased for inflation. So it started off at about $11 million and again, 13.61 million now. But like I said, that's scheduled to sunset in January of 2026, where the estate tax exemption goes down to about $7 million. So if that's going to expose you or your estate to an estate tax, then you could revisit your estate tax to make sure that, or your estate plan to make sure that we minimize that exposure to the estate tax. It's at a very high rate, 40% of anything above the exemption. Another change, recent major change to California law was Proposition 19. Before Proposition 19, we had Proposition 13 that said that we have limitations of how our um, property taxes will increase every year. Instead of increasing based on the fair market value of your um, property that year, it increases incrementally. It has a cap as to how much you can increase. What Proposition 19 did was severely limit um, the, the property tax exclusion for um, parent to child transfers. Before we had Prop 58 that said uh, any transfer from a parent to child will be excluded from reassessment. So when I pass away and I leave my, my children my property, they take my property with my assessed value and pay whatever I was paying for property tax. So there was a, an exclusion from reassessment for that transfer to my children. But what Prop 19 did was say that exclusion applies in very limited circumstances. First, this property has to be my primary residence. And second, my child has to use it for his or her primary residence for the exclusion to apply. Not only that, if I did leave this property and it already is my primary residence and my child's primary residence, the exclusion is only up to a million dollars. So if I bought the property for $500,000 and its assessed value at the time of my death was $750,000, but now I've transferred to my child and it's worth $3 million, then the exclusion only applies from 750, my assessed value, to 1.75, the $1 million exclusion. And so anything above 1.75 million to $3 million, that 1.25, is going to be added to my assessed value of 750 so that my child's property tax assessed value is going to be $2 million. So Prop 19 severely changed and limited um, the exclusions that apply when properties are transferred to our children. And so um, that definitely is going to change the way that people want to dispose of their assets. Um, and it's something that, you, that warrants another look at your estate plan. Um, by the way, I always want to mention to my clients that if you do intend to move out of state or if you do move out of state, you definitely want an attorney in that state to take a look at your estate plan, um, make sure that it's still consistent with that state's laws. Every state is going to be different and according um, because we all have a different probate code that governs these trusts. Um, we, for instance, California is one of nine community property states and my trusts always refer to assets as community property, separate property. That's not going to make sense in common law states, the non-community property states. So definitely want to revisit your estate plan if you move out of state. Outdated plans, um, some issues that arise out of outdated plans. We have often had these do-it-yourself plans. I had a call the other day with a brother and sister. A sister was very concerned about their dad who owns property in Irvine in his own name, but he is in the Philippines. And in the background, I hear the brother say, why do you need an attorney to take care of this? We can just do this on LegalZoom. 
So I start asking some questions. I asked, well, if your dad's in the Philippines, is he a, a US citizen? The answer was no. Um, the, the brother says, well, why don't we just add ourselves to the house so that we're joint tenants with dad and when he passes away, it automatically goes to us. Um, I hear that and I automatically say, well, you're telling me that your dad's not a citizen, you're thinking about adding yourselves as joint tenants, so now you've touched on the estate tax, you've touched on the property tax and income taxes, any of which would have been completely eradicated or you wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been an issue if you just created a trust and visited an attorney. Um, the amount that you would have paid for an attorney to draft a well a well crafted trust, a tax efficient trust, would have saved you so much in all three of those taxes, much more than what you would pay if you try to do it yourself. So I don't believe in do-it-yourself trust. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know the issues that are going to arise um, when you add people as joint tenants or when you um, have a non-US citizen as um, the person creating the trust. Uh, let's see, outdated provisions, oftentimes I see old um, old provisions that need to be updated. For instance, no contest clauses are a big deal. No contest clauses say, if anyone can test the terms of my trust and they don't receive anything. And if you have an outdated trust that simply says something like that, that no contest clause is not gonna be um, affected to the extent that you think it will be affected. Um, another issue that arises out of old estate plans, all the trustees that you've named have passed. And so we were saying earlier that in your estate plan, you're going to say, when I pass away, I want these list of successor trustees to step in my um, in my place and distribute the assets according to my wishes. If you have an old estate plan, this is something we've seen. All the trustees have passed. Now we have to go to court to ask a judge to help us appoint another trustee. So that issue arises. Um, some of the plans don't address tax elections. Um, and that can really help minimize those taxes, whether it's estate taxes or um, income taxes. And um, old estate plans, definitely if your estate plan was drafted before 2010, there's a major change in the law in 2010. Lots of trusts say that assets, lots of clients who have pre-2010 trusts think that their trust says everything goes to the surviving spouse not realizing that what that means is that all the assets in their trust will be divided into two different trusts after they pass away. I've had clients with these old trusts come into my um, my office and they're very upset because they were told that everything goes to the surviving spouse. Um, so if you have a pre-2010 trust, you might want someone to take a look at that and explain what it really says and update it according to your wishes. So what should you do at this point? I would say make it a habit of reviewing your estate plan every three to five years. Review your beneficiaries, your fiduciaries, review your documents, review all those assets to make sure that they fall into those right buckets. You don't want anything in your own name with no beneficiary, nothing in that probate bucket. Look at your bank statements to make sure that you're not the only one listed. If you are the only one listed, make sure you have a beneficiary. Look at your deeds to make sure that they are in the trust, your properties are in the trust. And if you have business interests, you have shareholder and membership interest certificate, um, certificates, um, make sure those are also titled in the trust. And review your beneficiary designations for all the assets that are in that second bucket, the payable on death bucket. They're still titled in your name. Make sure you look at the beneficiaries to um, and that they are consistent with your wishes. Don't name minors as beneficiaries. If they ever inherit assets, we have to go through not only a probate proceeding, we also have to go through guardianship. Okay, I think that's all I have for today. Um, Sherry, do we have questions? I think we have a few minutes to answer some of the, some of the questions. Yeah, let's see. Um, there is uh, a question. If the business is in the trust and the business gets sued, is the trust exposed? Yeah, if the business is sued. So if you have a corporation, then if the liability is arising from the corporation, then it is protected um, by but it only assets or the lawsuit can only reach the assets of that corporation. Um, your personal assets are still protected in the same way that if you had your business titled in your individual name. Titling your business in the name of the trust or your business interest in the name of the trust doesn't change who's liable for that creditor to that creditor. Perfect. We have another question. Uh, can you speak about holding rentals in an LLC and then the death beneficiary in the family trust? Um, if you hold rentals in an LLC, 
I hope I'm answering or understanding this question. Um, we often do at least raise the question of holding or uh, liability for our clients who have rental property. And if you hold your rental property, instead of just putting it in the trust, you title you um, the deed reflects ownership in an LLC instead. Then what that does is protect you from um, inside liabilities and outside liabilities. What I mean by that is for inside liabilities, if your rental property is in the LLC and your tenant wants to sue you, that's an inside liability. And the tenant can only reach the assets that are inside the LLC. The LLC is also helpful to protect you from outside liabilities. If you get into a car accident, that's a liability that arose from outside of the LLC, outside of your rental property. And so if you get into a car accident and they try to sue you, they can only reach assets um, that are in your own name. They can't reach assets that are in this LLC. So the, I think, I hope that answers the question. And then you said something about um, naming a beneficiary. Um, can you repeat that part, Sherry? Uh, let me go back to that one. Uh, if a business is in the trust and the business gets sued, is the trust exposed? Yeah, so it's um, the holding an asset in the trust. The LLC interest itself is actually going to be owned by the trust. So that it's the your interest in that LLC is not in the probate bucket. We're going to draft an assignment to transfer your membership interest in the LLC to the trust. But even if that membership interest is in the trust, like I said, there's inside liabilities that keep um, the, the liability inside the LLC, but it arises from inside the LLC. There are outside liabilities that keep the um, liability outside the LLC if the um, creditor is one that has arisen outside of the LLC. And then there's a second part to that question, I think. Uh, let's see. I think we have another one very similar. If I transfer property from my name to an LLC, does it trigger a taxable event? Okay, there, whenever we deal with property, we are so careful about making sure that a property tax exemption or an exemption from reassessment applies. And the exemption for a reassessment that we're looking to um, apply in when we transfer properties into an LLC is the proportionate interest exemption. And if you wholly own a piece of property, you're the 100% owner of a property, and you transfer it into an LLC that is 100% owned by you, then it's not it's not going to be exempt. Uh, I'm sorry, it is exempt. It's not going to be reassessed because it's a proportionate transfer of interest. You own 100% the LLC. You own 100% of the LLC, and so the proportionate interest are the same. If you and your um, friend own 50-50 of this property, and then you transfer to an LLC that you own 50-50 with your friend, same thing, it's a proportionate interest transfer and it's exempt from um, reassessment. If you don't own a proportionate interest in the LLC that you are transferring your property into, then there is a reassessment of that property. Thank you so much, Tiffany. We have a couple other questions, which I'm going to have um, emailed to you. So maybe we can get a little bit of an answer as we are getting really close to the end of our webinar tonight. Um, I wanted to thank you once again, Tiffany. You've done a wonderful job. You've, you've answered so many questions. Um, I think it's just been an awesome evening. Um, and again, if you want to chat with Tiffany or myself, um, you can get a hold of her directly. You can call me. I would love to hook you up with her. Uh, she's a wonderful uh, resource and just a, a wonderful uh, resource for getting your, your estate in good working order. Uh, also, if you want to do a consultation with an advisor here at Marshall Reddick, um, we will definitely be in touch with you and get you everything you need to be be ready to go with that. Um, before we leave tonight, I know we're getting close to the end, but I did want to mention that you can download a free uh, copy of our property rating ebook um, for all investors. I think it's like the, the primer, something everybody should read, and it's probably a 20-minute read, downloadable for free. And I think it's something that you would definitely get a lot of information from, just like tonight's information as well. Um, and we also, once this has uh, ended tonight, we will also be able to get a copy of it on our website, as well as other information, other education. We have webinars that are uh, on our website, all different topics. You can 
download a, uh, a, a login password and become a member for free. And you can learn about a multitude of uh, information and topics specific to investors. Thank you. And if you need anything, please feel free to reach out to me, reach out to Tiffany. I can get in touch with her as well for you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.